Welcome to the Real Estate Niche Show, a show that focuses on top real estate professionals who specialize in different niches of real estate. My name is Ben Kogut. Join me as we dive deep into the professional and personal lives of the experts of the real estate industry. Welcome to the Real Estate Niche Show. I'm your host, Ben Kogut, and today I am honored to have Mark Caesar on the show today. Mark is from Philadelphia, New Jersey, Philadelphia area. He has historically been a residential wholesaler, uh, had a lot of success with that. And then back in 2018, he decided to pivot into the commercial real estate, uh, the commercial multifamily space. So apartment investing, he has his own podcast, he has his own network that he's in. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Maybe share a little bit more background uh, on, on your work and yourself. Sure, ben, uh, yeah, sure. I appreciate the opportunity, Ben, and I'm glad to connect with you and your audience. So um, I am actually from Brooklyn, New York, um, born oh, and raised. <laughs> no worries, no worries. But um, I... We actually started my journey back in 2012. Uh, someone someone introduced me to the Rich Dad Poor Dad book. I, I know that's very cliche, and that's that's probably like the number one book that's helped a lot of entrepreneurs um, become entrepreneurial minded. But I read that book, and it made sense. You know, I was a college student at that time. It everything clicked. You know, it's the the concept of assets over liabilities and having your passive income surpass your expenses then you can get out of that rat race. And I, that's what I wanted. Fast forward, attended a Kiyosaki uh, uh, event in 2012, 2013 in, in Manhattan and real estate was the focal point. Like, okay, I analyzed and I saw that, hey, real estate is owned by a lot of people, especially the wealthy. They have a vast majority of real estate in their portfolio. I needed to be in the, in the game as well. But again, college student, no job, very little money. Uh, the the bar, the margins to get in, slim to none for me. So I had to figure out, okay, how do I get in? That's where wholesaling kicked in. And uh, it took me about two, three years to actually fully immerse myself in wholesaling. Again, New York is a very crazy market and very um, hard to enter into the real estate space with the high prices that are very high year round. So I decided to pivot into another market and lo and behold, I saw my then partner who was investing in Philadelphia as a wholesaler. I reached out and said, Hey, let's connect. How can, you know, how can I get started? And that's where my journey of wholesaler started um, in 2015. Got it. That's where I got the Philadelphia part from your bio. <laughs> Apologies for mixing that up. No okay, worries. Great. So, so were you working from Brooklyn, but doing deals in Philadelphia with a partner? Is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. So I was cool. uh, the acquisitions person, um, you know, pretty much just finding the sellers, finding the properties. And my partner, she lived in Philadelphia at that time. She was my boots on the ground uh, doing the, you know, meeting the sellers and contractors and so forth. Nice. All right. Keep going. Yeah. So um, pretty much that it took me again. It took me uh, two years to get my first deal done. Um, I've always been in the mindset that I don't like quitting when I, when I start something. So even though it took two years, uh, when I first got that, when I signed that seller signed that contract and I got wired that 10 grand check and I made five grand out of it, my partner, we split a 50, 50. It was just like, all right, this thing works. Let's, let's duplicate it. Let's see how we can 10 exit. And from there, I've pretty much, um, I've entered the the market of Philadelphia at a opportune time because then houses were pretty much um, very uh, at a lower point of entry to buy. And not a lot of people were really focusing on, on Philadelphia at that time. So I would, I was able to really cat, um, really cash into that, into that niche and just wholesale a ton of houses. You know, I was buying houses for $2,500, $800, and just pretty much um, assigning my equitable interest over to investors who are either going to fix and flip them or add them to the portfolio as a rental property. So it was, it was, it was an interesting lesson. It was an interesting time, but again, still, I like to quote this, you know, young and dumb, um, just learning. And of course you get all that money, 
you're seeing piles of money come in. But when I started losing a lot of that money, I realized, okay, this business is very transactional. You know, once I share, sell my shares, sell my interest, I have nothing left. So now I have to go back to the drawing board and it became a job. And no, you know, I'm not taking any, uh, any uh, hits or throwing any darts at anyone who, who still works at W2 or who loves W2s. I think there's a place and time for it. But for me, I've never been privy to W2s. I mean, I did them, but that wasn't my end all be all. I wanted the passive income and that's where multifamily came in. I've always... Uh, New York City is great. Is uh, I think about a great 80% of it is filled with apartment buildings and I've lived in apartments a uh, majority of my life. So I've always been interested and had a knack for wanting to learn how to get into apartment investing, but I never knew how. And of course, in my mindset, I've always had the mentality that uh, only a rich guy with a million dollars plus in their account who can cut that check right then and they can own an apartment building. So 2018, fast forward, I read an article by Michael Blanc and he made it, I attended one of his um, webinars and it just seemed so simple. So I took a leap of faith, invested into his mentorship program and I immersed myself in that program. I killed the program in, in a week's time. And wow. it, it's a, uh, it's a lengthy program. But I did it in a week's time and I really understood, okay, anybody can get into apartment and build apartment investing. It just takes, time it just takes a team and you know a few other components and i was like you know what i want to do this i believe in it let's get let's get rolling so 2018 2019 came around i got my first uh deal on the contract uh within three months of the program i was very so stoked but then due diligence came around failed due diligence so my partner now we decided hey we're going to back out we want to protect our investors you know let's let's move forward Got another deal under contract a few months later. All right. Yes, that's cool. Awesome. Sellers weren't being transparent with us. Sellers didn't want to disclose a lot of things. So that fell through. So it, it became disparaging and it can get disparaging at, at a point in time. But I, for me, I like to look at, okay, what are the reasons why did this work? This didn't work. You know, what can I learn from this? What can, how can I get better? So I analyzed a lot of these things. But in the process, I needed money now. So, you know, again, I have a family to care. I have bills to pay. So I decided to revert back to wholesaling. Lo and behold, who could have predicted a pandemic kicking in? And 2020 came around. My business pretty much uh, tanked. Uh, no money's coming in. Wholesaling is, is a dud for me. No one's really selling anymore. So, okay. So, all right, I need to find something to do again. I, you know, I have kids, I have a wife, I have, you know, bills to pay. I need to take, you know, take care of stuff. So, but then whole um, multifamily just kept coming back, you know, everywhere. I'm, I'm very heavy on LinkedIn. I'm following people on LinkedIn, multifamily, multifamily, multifamily. So I said, you know what? I started learning about this. I had two deals on the contract. Let's, what would I have to lose? So let's jump into multifamily full-time. 2021 came around. I've really immersed myself into multifamily. I've uh, pretty much been really networking, building a strong network of investors. And here we are today. We're still looking for our first deal, my partner and I, but I, I put the place, the pieces in place where I can find a success that I need once that deal come around. And I, I truly believe deep within me that it's around the corner. It's just, you know, being consistent with what I have to do every day. Wow. What a, uh, what a story, what a, uh, just the perseverance and the, you keep pushing brother. I, I love it. And I know that you're on the right path as well. And so let's talk Thank a little you. bit about, um, I, I'd love to know about uh, those, the deals that you found or how are you going about finding deals? And then what have been some of the lessons? I mean, we, we, I, I find deals all the time and we have to kill them through due diligence. It's a frustrating process. Um, yeah. what, 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 what has been your uh, experience with that process? So great question. And for me to find deals, I build relationship with brokers in the markets that I'm looking into. So 
at that point in time, I was living in New York and North Carolina was one of my major markets. And I pretty much just either went through LoopNet, you know, found some a few deals. I underwrote it. If it didn't make sense, I shot the broker at, uh, a message like, hey, you know, I looked at this deal, I underwrote it. This is why it didn't make sense to us. But we are, you know, we're building a network. We're tapping into the market. We are looking for X amount, you know, X deals, you know, here's our criteria. If you have anything, please send it to us. And a lot of brokers, the thing that I've learned about brokers is that you, you don't want to waste their time. You want to give them feedback. You know, you don't want to reach out to them and then just disappear and 10 days later come back and say, hey, yeah, you know, I have, you know, I underwrote this deal because they're not going to take you serious. Again, this is their livelihood and this is your livelihood. This is how they feed their family. So you want to make sure that you're in constant communication with them, you're interacting with them and giving, even if it's just a simple email, like, hey, you know, this still doesn't work for us. It doesn't make sense. Can you send us something else? They'll appreciate that. So I've learned to really just stay in front of that, of that process where whatever deal I look at, I shoot the broker, uh, uh, you know, an email or a phone call or text within 24 to 48 hours. Hey, you know, this, this didn't work for us, you know, or ask more questions, just keep the communication, the lines of communication open. And from there, they're seeing that they're, they'll respect that. They'll respect the fact that you're respective of their of their time and that you are, you know, you're considerate enough to just tell them, okay, why this this was good, why this wasn't bad. And from there, they'll start building that trust and rapport with you, and they'll be able to send you more more leads coming in. So that's that's the number one way that I've been finding the um, leads and deals. Um, I've been sourcing them over the years. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, especially uh, with the fact that your podcast and the background behind you on the Zoom here is no BS apartment investing. And so yeah, uh, that definitely isn't a lot. You're 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 speaking your truth and you're um you're providing no BS feedback back to the brokers and same thing, I'm sure, back to your investors. And so uh, and now you you started a podcast to to share the the wisdom and, and lessons that you're learning along the way. And so um, yeah. I can't wait to uh, can't wait to hear more and and, and see what uh, what happens after you get your first deal. So um, to, I, I am also curious um, if you could talk a little bit about what where's been like the overlap or the lessons learned from your wholesaling days now coupled with what you're working on now with the apartment investing business. Sure. So I approach it in a way where I want to make sure they intertwine in a, in a sense because. Nowadays, especially in the climate of the, the markets that we're in right now, with everything being heavily overpriced and compressing and cap rates and so forth, more people are looking to find the off-market deals and or the pocket listing with the brokers. And you know, brokers are not going to just send anyone their pocket listing. They want to make sure they have a relationship with that person. They were able to successfully close with them before they can give you, you know, those pocket listings. So for me, I'm carrying what I've learned from wholesaling, whereas, OK, if I want to go direct to seller now, I, I have a system where I know how to market to the sellers. You know, it's it may be different because of the, the level of marketing you're doing and the target mark the target, which is from residential. You can just send a seller a letter like, hey, are you interested in buying? Are you interested in selling and so forth? But an apartment building most sellers, they, they have to see, they, you have to show them a reason why they need to sell. So if you're, if you're looking at the, if you're driving by in the area and you see, okay, the property is not well-maintained or uh, it's not uh, contract services are not being applied where, you know, the lawn is just not, uh, not cured or, you know, the roof is had patches and so forth, then you might, that might be a motivated seller. You might just call them, Hey, listen, I saw this apartment building, and, you know, I'm an investor in an area. I wanted to, you know, see if you were interested in selling. But in the in the interim, before you get to that point, you want to build a report because that property, though it might look ugly on the outside, it might be a cash cow for that investor. So you might want to build, you want to build that report with them and help them understand, show them like, hey, you know, this is what I do. You know, how, you know, how did you find that deal? How did you, you know, how do you like the market? You know, stuff like that. And over time, you're, you know, as you're building that report, you're building that friendship with them, then you can start throw subtle cues like, hey, you know, if you're interested in selling, think of me first. You know, I'm interested. I'm very I'm active in the market. I'm looking to buy. So tips like that, I'm pretty much carrying them over from the wholesale and residential side into the multifamily side where it's uh it it will bring dividends, you know, um, you know, just pulling lists from Coastar, 
and um, cold calling sellers or selling sending mailers. So these are things that I've actually applied from into this bit into this model now from my wholesaling time. That's great. Yeah, I uh, I think all that makes sense, and um, it's uh, we've also learned that it's putting systems like that in place and being in front of the sellers, being or owners, being in front of brokers, and and next thing you know, deal flow starts coming your way. I'd love to to flip it to the other side and ask about how you're going about um, building relationships and finding investors to partner with. Sure. So. Um... Right now, I'm very heavy on prospecting on and via LinkedIn. So I have a coach. He definitely uh, uh, coined this phrase, which is LinkedIn is for prospecting and Facebook and other social media is for presence building. So I've taken time out to build a brand where when I'm prospecting and I'm reaching out to whether it's accredited investors, sophisticated investors or, you know, operators in the niche, I would reach out to them and let them know, hey, you know, this is who I am. This is what I do. And this is what value I bring to the table. So for me, I'm heavy in strategic partnering with individuals where I've taken the time out to learn how to underwrite. I've taken the time out to learn how to do a proper market analysis, how to look for market trends and look for evolving or emerging markets in various cities. So I've built that skill set. So when I approach, uh, let's say I approach uh, uh, an operator or a syndicator, I would let them know, hey, this is what value I bring. I can do a market analysis. I can you know, show you the emerging markets. I don't need to be added to the GP. I simply want to bring that value. And if you're interested, I can show you how to how this can be a win win by you leveraging my network, whether it be for capital raising, whether it be for lending, whatever it is. And in return, I in return for you leveraging my network, I don't need a piece of the GP. I just need to simply be able to reinvest into the deal as an LP. And a lot of people find that very enticing because, again, you don't want to come to the table to anyone and have the conversation one sided. You want to first add value to them. And in return, they will provide you uh, a compensation of some sort so that I'm big on adding value to others and finding out, okay, what difficulties or challenges are you having now? And how can I help you overcome those difficulties? And in return, we can talk about, you know, whatever you want to share with me. Nice. So what I'm hearing is that um, you're you're building your network of investors. You're using LinkedIn uh, for prospecting. I love that uh, what your coach taught you about using the other social media networks for presence building. And yeah, that's wonderful. I'm definitely going to remember that one. Uh, and then you're also, you're, you're approaching a variety of different um, sponsors, GPs who are actually able to, who maybe have a bit of more of a track record, who are able to get deals under contract and who may need help from people like you who are, leveraging their your network and relationships to raise capital in order to add value in that way and potentially other ways to um, make the deals happen and how you how you get compensated I mean that's that's your business um, and um, yeah is that did I kind of hit all that right yeah you definitely did um again you know it's um it, it's it's pretty simple um you know prospecting is a big thing you definitely need to prospect every day. Um, to find the pieces that you need to help your to help your business succeed, and I'm very big on just reaching out to people and you know just finding ways to add value. Before I even ask them, hey, you know, I have a deal, or do you want to invest in this? You know, how can I help you? What can I take off your plate? What can I do for you? Yeah, the tried tried and true sales technique. So, uh, bravo to you. That's awesome. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, let's. Uh, let's let's pivot a little bit and, and, uh, unless there's anything else you want to talk about on that topic, wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about your mindset. Cause I can definitely tell that, um, you have, uh, an abundance mindset and you have a, uh, giving value first mindset. And, and, and those are definitely in line with how I feel about, uh, business as well. And so, um, let, but let's go a little bit further back because I feel like there's been some lessons learned along the way. So like, one of the questions I like to dig into is like, what's been the first or the worst job you ever had? Because I, I, I find that a lot of different wis- you know, wisdom and things come out of those bad experiences that happened early on. 
Uh, any any stories from that? Um, sure. I, I've had a, a few uh, random jobs. Um, you know, I've done retail. I've done door to door sales. I think the f- worst job that I've probably had was. Hmm. I, I that's that's a very <laughs> that's a very thought provoking question there. Um, I wouldn't honestly say I've had any um, worse jobs. I think a lot, all the W-2s that I've had, um, they've pretty much built, helped frame who I am and built, you know, the person that I am now because I started off um, um, in retail selling sneakers. Um, I've, I did not like the job at first because again, it was, uh, it's very territorial. It's, um, it's doggy dog, you know, you're, you know, you're hustling for commissions, you know, selling X amount of sneakers for commission and so forth. But I've, through that, it, it gave me that grit and that tenacity that I need to make sure that, okay, I I want to be the best. I want to be the best um, salesperson. I want to outdo everyone else. Um, It might sound a little facetious in a bit, but that's that's the mentality that I like that that I have, especially as a New Yorker. You know, we we're very um prideful, um a prideful bunch of people and we we like to outdo each other. So in a good way. Um, you know, I've done the door-to-door sales, I've sold vacuum cleaners. If anyone knows the Kirby vacuum cleaner, those very expensive uh, vacuum, I've sold those. Wow. And you know, I've learned a lot from that, you know, how to interact with people, how to you know, build rapport, how to pretty much um, overcome objections. Because again, with that job, you had to, you know, go to people's doors. They don't know you. They don't, you know, you have to show them, okay, why should I let you into my house and do an hour presentation? And you had to break those, those guards and those, bring those walls down. And I've learned how to do that. And again, a compilation of all those things, I, I can now take them and apply them to what I'm doing now. Because again, it's the same thing when you're when you're talking to investors or accredited or sophisticated investors, you're asking them, "Hey, I, I I'm bringing you an opportunity. Can you you know are you interested in investing? You have to show people why. Hey, why do I want to trust you with fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, or half a uh, half a million dollars of my hard earned money?" what do I, you know, I don't know you from a fly on the wall. I don't know you from anywhere. Why should I trust you with my money? So this is where the mindset of people do business with who they know, like, and trust. So you have to build that rapport. You have to build that trust factor. And from there, once you once you bring that trust factor, the vehicle, which is multifamily or real estate itself, it sells itself. But people want to be able to trust you. They want to, you know, relate to you. So my biggest thing is I like to show people like, okay, I'm just like you, you know, I work hard, I'm trustworthy and not just trustworthy by, by, you know, word of mouth, but I want to show you that, okay, my actions and my day to day, you know, that I'm ethical. And this is where branding comes into place. You want to brand yourself as someone who's an expert in your field. You want to brand yourself as someone who's knowledgeable. And when people start seeing that and they're seeing it on a consistent basis, they're willing, they're more than willing to take a shot with you than someone who's just knocking at the door and say, Hey, you know, I have the smoking idea. Can you invest 50 grand? They'll probably look at you like, okay, I don't know, you know, thank y'all pass. Even it might be a smoking deal, but they might not want to do it with you. But they'll take the chance on someone else who they've taken the time to know to um, you know, they know your family members, you know, you send them gifts, you know, you go, you guys go out to, you know, to the bar and drink or something, have dinner, they'll they're more receptive to that person. I think those are all great lessons learned. And and going back to your uh, door-to-door sales day, I had a very, very short stint of uh, doing door-to-door sales. And I think I, uh, I think I knocked on 400 doors to get one sale. I mean, something crazy like that. And um, uh, I was just curious, what, what did you have any lessons learned around uh, the mentality of rejection? Um, rejection is never easy. So uh, I, I won't sit here and lie and say, yeah, I, I did not take certain rejections personally, because again, um, when you're knocking on someone's door, technically, and really you're looking at them as your paycheck, uh, where I'm just going to be candid. You're looking at them as your paycheck. You know, that's how you're going to feed yourself and your family. So, but I've learned to overcome those objections. You know, we had a, 
at Kirby, we had a small um, sales clincher book. It, it gave us all the potential rejections and how to overcome them. But for me, I don't like things that are too scripted because it makes you seem robotic in a sense. So when I'm talking to people and they give me an objection, I want to sell them on the fact that, okay, I hear your objection, but think about this, you know, how this is how this can help you and your family. This is how this is beneficial for you. And again, this all ties back to, you know, build a rapport. So how you build the rapport in the beginning, you can sort of build, it's like uh, you're building a, a, you're building a roadblock from, I mean, you're building a, a, a step from there. As, as they always say, your first impression is your defining one. So, you know, how you approach that customer in the beginning, if you approach them with an attitude or, you know, you're a know-it-all, you've automatically put them in high alert. Like, all right, I don't want to deal with this guy, but, you know, I'm going to give you all the objection. But if you're coming at them friendly, if you're coming at them like, all right, I really want to help you. I'm not just looking at you as my patient, but I really believe in my product. I want to help you. Then again, those defenses start kicking down and now you can pretty much just overcome every objection, you know, certain objections, for example, like I would get, Hey, Hey, you know, I need to talk to my husband. Okay, great. We can talk to your husband. But in the meantime, this is what this can do for you. This is how this can do for you. Do you not think your husband would be, you know, happy that you've, you know, you understand the fact that this is beneficial for you and so forth. And you just add on to that. Of course, you want to talk to your spouse at a later time, but then again, you just want to make sure that you're not salesy and you're not being very pushy and aggressive, especially in this modern day world where they tell you, you know, in order to get the sale, you have to be pushy and push. You have to be pushy and very salesy. But again, it's all about relationships, building that rapport with people. And I'm a big advocate for that. Amen. It's all about relationships. hundred uh, percent. Let's pivot and kind of keep bringing that forward as we're, um, we have probably another five more minutes or so. How does, uh, how does Mark these days, how are you investing in yourself? Awesome question. I read a ton of books. Well, I won't lie. I am a big audible listener. So I listen mm-hmm. to a lot of books, um, whether it's self-help mindsets, um, you know, books on building systems, built books on how others find success, how to, you know, how to, how to read people, how to understand people and how to build those relationships. So I'm, I'm very big on, on, um, books. I also, um, I'm very big on coaching. So there is a place and time for coaching. Um, I definitely like to invest in my coaching. So if there's something that I want to get better at, I definitely invest in coaching. I am also part of an amazing group called the GOB apartment, um, GOB network. Um, the founder actually created that platform for multifamily purposes, real estate in a, in a sense, but a heavy focus on apartment where he wanted to democratize the fact that you don't need to spend, you know, double fig, double digits, uh, you know, income or money to pay for coaching. But instead, if you, you know, just ask around, there are people out there who are readily available to, to help you and to provide you with free knowledge. And that's what the GOB actually embodies, where we have a ton of uh, expert operators, syndicators, capital raisers within the team, and they each bring a piece of their knowledge to the fold and people like myself or people like, you know, who are aspiring to be investors or newbies can come in and pretty much just nitpick from everyone. And from there, you can also partner with people. You can find whatever you need, whether it's a key principal, whether it's a sponsor, lender or whatever, everything is in that group. And I definitely recommend people to, to check it out. If you, um, I think, I believe the website is uh, www.gobnetwork.com. And you definitely would need somebody to sponsor you. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can definitely talk further. Nice. Nice. Is it, uh, is it just multifamily or is it, cause I, I actually am a syndicator that I don't do multifamily. Is it? So I'm just curious. No, no, it's, it, you can, uh, any facets of real estate. We have guys who okay. do mobile home parks. We have guys who do self storage, who do ground up construction. So Ed, we we're about 400, um, members deep right now. So there are a uh, various approaches. So once you get in, you can find whatever niche that works for you and just talk to the, the experts and they'll be able to, they'll walk you through and help you out. Nice. Cool. Let's keep moving forward. How does, uh, how does Mark invest in the community? I invest in the community at the time by giving, just giving back what I've learned. I am, um, I've created a thought leadership platform you know, via a meetup. Of course, my podcast, No BS Apartment Investing Podcast. 
I just like to, whatever knowledge I've learned over the years, I just like to reciprocate it and give it back. You know, I believe that knowledge is a powerful tool. And with the knowledge and of, of course, applied knowledge, you people can get so far. So whatever I learn, I don't charge anybody for it. I, you know, put out content every day, you know, just to educate people. Okay. This is real estate. Why real estate? Why apartment investing? You know, how to, you know, how to talk to people, how to connect with people, how to build a brand. So I just like to give back in the form of knowledge. And of course, as I get, you know, as I reach uh, certain milestones in my goals, then I will um, enhance that into monetary where I, I do want to be philanthropic. That's one of my biggest goals where I want to give back to charity, you know, foreign charities and so forth. But right now, I'm just giving it back in form of um, in, in my thought leadership platforms. Nice. Nice. And, and last question is, how do you define the word success? Awesome question. Um, To me, success is not just... Uh, it's not just derived from achieving a goal, but I think it is more so it is definitely is achieving a goal, but how you help others achieve their goals above yours. Again, we, we live in a very, we live in a very selfish um, world in a sense where people, not everyone, but a lot of people are all about me, 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 but for me, success is okay. How can I help the next person get to where they need to get? How can I help them, you know, grow their business? How can I help them, you know, meet their goals? Because without me wanting anything or any compensation or anything in return, because I believe that I'm a firm believe that if I help someone, they can go out and help two, 22 to 20 people. And the process um, continues in return. I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate that it will come back to me one in on full circle, a hundred fold. So Success is really going out and put um, not thinking of yourself, but thinking of how you can better somebody else from their current situation, how you can show them how to be a better entrepreneur, how they can grow, how they can create um, legacy, how they can create fin um, financial freedom or or gain that uh that legacy wealth that a lot of people are aspiring to. And in the process, without me thinking of self, I know it's going to come back to me um, in abundance. Love it. Great. I, uh, I totally agree. Helping others is definitely a passion of mine as well. And making the world a better place is, is definitely a great mentality to have. So on that note, maybe share with everybody how, if someone wanted to reach out to you, how could they find you? Great. Um, awesome. Um, I'm again, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so you can definitely look me up at uh, LinkedIn for slash I N for slash Mark Caesar, M A R C C E S A R. You can also um, reach out to me on, on my podcast website, which is no BS apartment investing.com. Um, there you can listen to all the pod, the current podcasts that I have um, that's, that's dropped and you can leave your reviews, your comments, or if you have any questions um, or anything like that, feel free, reach out, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm also active on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Instagram is Mr. Success 50. That's the number five zero. Facebook is Mark Caesar. Mark Caesar two, I believe, but I'm sure um, Ben will put that, put all of those in the show notes, but yeah, yes. um, LinkedIn is the number one way to reach out to me. I, I answer very quickly and I get back, you know, I get back to people at a, at a speedy rate. I love LinkedIn. <laughs> nice. All right, guys, we'll hear that. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the real estate niche show. Um, yeah, we'll put all that in the show notes and, and thank you everyone for listening. Uh, if you'd like the show, please leave us a positive review, subscribe, and share with your friends so that we can get more great guests like, like Mark on the show. And so on that note, I um, hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, thanks, thanks Ben. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Real Estate Niche Show. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from me or the show, you can follow me on Instagram at Ben Kogut and at The Real Estate Niche Show. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.